and uh, welcome back to this plenary session. All of you have been uh, interacting with Professor Fisher, although we have not given you a formal introduction to Professor Fisher. Of course, we've put his uh, brief profile in your uh, kit. I hope all of you have had an opportunity to go through it. If you have seen that, you will know that Professor Fisher has had a long uh, uh, understanding of India as well as comparative constitutions. He has worked with uh, SOAS, which is one of the most uh, reputed institutions working in, in the area of Asian studies. Uh, you will also know that uh, currently he is based uh, in Delhi. I have been mentioning from the beginning that Professor Fisher has been most supportive in uh, identifying the simulation problem thinking that it will be suitable to all of you and he's spent the last two days uh, even yesterday he was here till seven o'clock although he had a session this morning uh, he was here till seven uh, guiding all of you and ensuring that you understood the problem and you're, you were able to um, use the inputs that we have been giving you over the last couple of days this is an ongoing process we do understand that this is a learning process we are not trying to debate that this is not learning and that you, are, you, are, you, you already know everything. All that we are hoping is that you are able to integrate what you are listening to in the form of the plenaries into the simulation that you are doing. So we are hoping to see, so if we had a talk on federalism, we were hoping to see that coming into your presentations. If we have had a discussion on minority rights, we were hoping to see that discussion on minority rights coming in when people are formulating their propositions or formulating the process. And the topic that uh, Professor Fisher is looking at today is something that the other speakers really have not touched upon and which is very significant. There were a couple of questions also for Dr. Nicole as well about the use of the judiciary in the whole process. Uh, one of the interesting things is that when we're looking at constitutional design, uh, that is really not where the judiciary comes in. But if you're looking at, you know, a modern constitution, how much of a role do we look uh, and what kind of a role do we look, to look at the judiciary uh, performing? How do we assess its role? What would its inputs be? And um, I think this, this will be one of the most important sessions uh, in this area. I again thank Professor Fisher for taking the time out and being with us the whole week and I uh, invite him to address the gathering. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Vasanti. Um, yeah, I'm very grateful that you have invited me to be here um, for this workshop on comparative constitutional law. Also very grateful to your two research assistants who have organized uh, everything in an absolutely brilliant fashion. And uh, so it's a great honor and privilege to be here at NALSA. I've been here before. Uh, you know, you can feel the excellence of this institution vibrating from the campus. Yeah, so the moment you step on its ground, sort of something changes in you. And I can also feel it when interacting with the students, how motivated you are, and uh, the sort of questions that you're asking. And that's also why in this lecture, I'm not trying to run you through each and every detail trying to describe various constitutional courts or cases, right? I'm trying to give you an overview and stimulate you to look at constitutional courts from the perspective of scholars from other disciplines, uh, see how they use other mes methods for understanding what constitutional courts and judges are doing, right? So it's really about introducing you to a number of key articles and books that will change the way that you as lawyers think about constitutional courts and what judges do and what your role is as a lawyer when maybe one day you're standing in the Indian Supreme Court. Um, so I will be uploading a link where you can have a look at these various articles, okay? Now, the first slide that you're seeing is is really, has really become a sort of commonplace in critical scholarship on constitutional law uh, and a means of trying to get lawyers out of their 
formalist textual jurisprudential thinking when it comes to constitutional interpretation. Right? So if you pick up Ren Herschel's book on juristocracy, this is actually the quote with which he begins the book. And behind this quote, there's a specific understanding of the meaning of language, yeah? every word as a symbol signifying a specific meaning, how these meanings are changing, and who has the power to decide what a word or a sentence actually means. Right? So I really like the way this ends with Humpty Dumpty saying the question is, which is to be master? That's all. Right? And that, of course, brings the entire political dimension of the work that constitutional courts do very much to the foreground. So I know that you as lawyers in your exams have to pretend, you know, you have to pretend that you know what the law is. Right? You have all these jurisprudential methodologies, you have your theories. So you are saying, I know what the law is. And you have to defend your position. But when you step back in a purely scientific realm, um, we all know that law is not like 2 plus 2 equals 4, right? It's actually very different from mathematics or other natural sciences. And in particular, if you look at constitutional courts over a longer period of time, you see the meaning of words change so dramatically that you don't have a choice but to accept that Humpty Dumpty is right. Yeah, you see this in relation to slavery in US constitutional law, you see this in relation to LGBT rights in Western constitutional law at the moment. There are dramatic shifts and things that we would have never thought possible coming out of a constitutional court are now happening all the time and are becoming the new established standard. In many, many ways, these new approaches that you are, uh, you know, the books that you're reading now that are published in 2005, 2011 or so, and the articles I'd be mentioning too, at the end of the day, they're all coming out of American legal realism, I would say. So this insight that the Constitution is what the judges say it is, is actually very old. Yeah? And uh, also, Charles Evans Hughes, he was a politician. He was running, he was a Supreme Court judge, stepped down, ran for president in the United States, lost, and later was appointed again as Chief Justice to the United States Supreme Court. Um, so this nexus between constitutional courts and politics in many countries is very obvious. It's also very obvious in Germany where politicians are appointed and so on and so forth. Yeah? So one thing seems to be clear, these courts are passing judgments that are quintessentially political, and they are pushed by various dynamics of litigation into political fields, and that's happening more and more. We're also living in a world in which courts are emerging more and more as the masters of constitutional meaning, right? If you look back 20, 30 years, or maybe 100 years, you will see that parliament and the executive play a much more active role in giving meaning to constitutional text. So we will ask why we see this rise of judicial power. We will take a little bit of a look at the consequences of it, and I will also give you some room to speculate about it, whether it's good or not, right? I don't want you to immediately jump into a normative debate, okay? We'll just observe for most of the time in this lecture. Um, and then, uh, let's get started by looking at uh, Chief Justice Hughes in action. He is part of a Supreme Court. I mean, he changes his voting patterns from time to time, but um, he stands at the end of a Supreme Court jurisprudence in the United States that is striking down a lot of social welfare legislation. Right? A court that seems to be obsessed with protecting property rights, trusts, uh, contractual rights, and a court that is actually striking down legislation that tries to abolish certain patterns of child labor, okay? Um, in great conflict to the New Deal legislation of President Roosevelt and the progressive movement of Theodore Roosevelt, yeah? So there's this clash between a conservative judiciary and the progressive movement, and of course you all know this from the 1950s, 1960s in India, how a court can stand in the way of what politicians really want. 
And Roosevelt gets so frustrated by his conflict with the court that he's passing, he's introducing legislation that would allow him to appoint so many Supreme Court judges, new judges, that he will change the way the court is voting. Okay? And because Hughes is very acute, acutely aware of the politics behind this, he starts lobbying in Congress on the one hand side for this act to be stopped, and at the same time, uh, he convinces the other judges on the court that they have to move in the direction of the New Deal. Okay, so that's why we say a switch in time saved nine. So that's our first dimension of constitutional court jurisprudence in a separation of power game. If you are a constitutional court judge, you have to be aware of the consequences of your judgment. Right? You have to be able to predict what's going to come after you pass your judgment. Will, you know, will your judgment be immediately overridden? I often wonder why is the Indian Supreme Court passing one judgment after the other in reservations and four weeks later you have a constitutional amendment? Yeah? How far can you look? What are you trying to achieve with this? Are you setting a symbol? Um, so that's something you need to know. You need to know that there are different types of backlash. Right? The government can just appo stop appointing judges or appoint more judges. The government can mess around with your budget. Yeah, there are many, many ways with which budgets, uh, governments can uh, punish a court. So that's the first dynamic that takes you out of this realm of judges sitting in their chamber, reading the legal arguments and deciding on that basis. Yeah, they're very much aware about what's going to happen after they pass the judgment. An even bigger puzzle is, why are politicians observing Supreme Court judgments? Why are so many politicians around the world institutionalizing constitutional courts? It's like they're coming and they're saying, please tie my hands and take away my power. And that's very, very odd. And if you read Nehru's writing, it wasn't like this at all 50, 60 years ago. Yeah? He simply said, I'm the prime minister. I'm going to sort out the water problems in the states by writing a letter to the chief ministers. Yeah? And if parliament decides we're going to have a land reform, we're going to have a land reform. Yeah? He's not saying, oh, let's see what the Supreme Court decides. Yeah? And this movement of politicians transferring this power, this element of deference to the court, very voluntary, that's something we have to get an answer for. Because the question that we want to be able to answer in the big scheme of things is whether the 20th century was the century of democracy. You see a massive rise of democracy over the last 200 years, really picking off in the 1940s, third wave of democracy, yeah, then later on. Um, so democracy becoming a dominant force, but also we see that constitutional rule, ruling by constitutional text, placing limits upon democracy, institutionalizing constitutional courts, is another dominant trend. So a German constitutional court judge has called the 20th century the century of judicial review. Yeah? That's the sort of significance that constitutional judicial review has in a global discourse. That's how important it is. There's one conference on it after the other. And of course, you're from the country where a lot of people say this is the world's most powerful court. Right? Your country is exceptional because you have managed to keep a constitution alive for almost 70 years on your own. Right? It's not like Germany and Japan where you had to be occupied and beaten with a stick. Yeah? You did it on your own. Um, your constitution didn't collapse. Most constitutions collapse after 19 years. Look at the history of constitutional law in Europe at the beginning of the 20th century. Yeah? A constitution lasts for five, six, seven years. Then there's another revolt, a revolution. Yeah? So there's a huge database now, and they, have, they can show you that the average lifespan of a constitution is 19 years. So India really, really stands out, also stands out in the ambition, declaring untouchability, unconstitutional, straight away, giving women the right to vote. Check when Switzerland gave all women the right to vote. Check how long interracial marriage was criminalized in the United States and the southern states, up to 1967. Yeah? So 
India there is a really remarkable moment. Um, so not only can you see a rise in the number of countries and constitutional texts, but you can also see other specific trends. If you look at the data, all of this is from the University of Austin, Texas, and their wonderful database on comparative constitutional law. Um, and um, Ginsburg, one of the leading scholars in this field, without any doubt, has 2014 published an article which I will put online, and there's a co-author which I don't remember, but he now looked at the number of countries and constitutions which have a constitutional, which have constitutional judicial review. And then the second graph also tells us that there is a specialized court for constitutional judicial review. Yeah? So they, these countries are taking constitutional judicial review so seriously that they're, more and more of them are actually institutionalizing a specific court. Yeah? So this is an absolutely incredible trend, global. And there's a lot that you can get out of studying this comparatively. And in my conclusion, I'll tell you a couple of reasons why. Now what I want to do is um, sort of want to do a brief simulation um, showing you how fragile or how flexible the meaning of constitutional text is. Um, so you take a look at the German constitution, for instance, human dignity. Nobody really knows what this means in a specific legal sense. Article 2 in the Constituent Assembly of Germany, they had a very simple uh, way of phrasing it. They said everybody can do whatever he wants. Yeah? And then by the end it comes out, free development of his personality. Yeah? So the language of constitutional uh, texts is in no way constraining upon constitutional court judges. Right? I mean, there's not even an effort to constrain them. Um, you've also heard on your first day that constitutional judicial review is more about principles and not about rules, and that rules are fixed. Yeah, there's a traffic light which is red, but um, think about Hart's example, no vehicles in the park. Yeah, that seems to be like a very clear rule, but then you have to ask yourself, what is a vehicle? Is a tricycle a vehicle? Yeah? Is a bicycle a vehicle? What if somebody has a heart attack in the car, uh, park and an ambulance has to drive into it? Yeah? So, is it really possible to think of a rule that's really watertight in terms of, you know, like you're programming a judge like a syllogism machine? Yeah? We put in this case, this is the outcome you're going to get. Um, I don't think we need to waste much time on this because in constitutional jurisprudence, it's obviously not the case. A wonderful example for this is um, Justice L.B. Sachs' leadership on uh, same-sex marriage. Yeah? And there's so much coming together on this. I'll put online a podcast when he's speaking at the University of Chicago, but also read about the, his biography. Yeah? He was assassinated by the South African Secret Service, lost an arm, lost an eye. And yeah? they put a bomb in his car. So he's actually a victim of state terrorism. So he brings this tremendous moral authority to the court. Why does he choose to use this authority to constitutionalize a right to same-sex marriage? That's the sort of questions I want us to ask. And um, a wonderful example for you to think about this uh, in India is this word consultation. In the Indian constitution and judicial appointments, what does consultation mean? It's established practice that at the end of the day, the Prime Minister tells the President what to do after consultation pro uh, process, and then it all changes dramatically. And look at the language the court is using in 1993, like the Pope, yeah? temple. Yeah? It's uh, a very religious, theocratic language, you can almost say. Supremacy, temple of justice, and so on and so forth. So again, my point is constitutional meaning shifts dramatically. Um, one of the f articles of the Indian Constitution which has never been amended, so the text is exactly the same as in 1950, is Article 21. Ginsburg would say, if you are a legal formalist, your assumption should be that the meaning of this text becomes clearer and clearer, and therefore there's less and less litigation. Right? So every time you have a litigation, your understanding of the text stabilizes. So for Article 21, you would assume there's a lot of litigation in the 1950s and little today, but it's exactly the opposite. 
Yeah? This is from some research that I'm doing. It's only up to 2009, but it shows to you that it's exactly the opposite. So the question for you is, what drives this explosion of Article 21 litigation after 1980? Yeah? And then also, can you compare it? Will you find similar patterns in other countries? And does this tell you something about how a constitutional court actually works? Okay. So what we're going to do today is we're going to back, go back to Griffith and we're simply going to assume a constitution is what happens, right? That's our scientific approach. We're not asking at the moment, is it good, is it bad? We're forgetting for the moment about normative dimensions and we'll go back to that later on. So if a constitution is what happens, I would like to ask you, what is your understanding where constitutional judicial review actually comes from? Does anybody have an idea? You, know, you can speculate. Hmm? Yes, rule of law. Could you be, in which sense do you mean? Constitutional or should not uh, be um, unjust. Okay. That yeah. is the source of rule of law. Okay, so this idea that the task of deciding what the law means vests into a specific institution in the in state. The rest of the people. Okay, so you have the king, you have parliament, and you have the judiciary. Okay? Marbury versus Madison. Yeah? So what you have said is absolutely right. Uh, the roots of modern judicial, constitutional judicial review reach back into yeah, disputes between the king and parliament and which sides parliament takes, so in Great Britain. But the first time it is articulated is in Marbury versus Madison. So I want to take away, you know, I'll put up an article by Robert Lowry, Lowry Clinton and it's a really wonderful piece of work. And uh, one of the things that you will take away from that is there is no specific intent in the Constituent Assembly of the United States of designing a Supreme Court with constitutional judicial review powers. Yeah? Some people speculate about it. It's mentioned in the federal papers, so the possibility is there. But they don't actually know precisely what they're getting into. Not everybody, I think, understands that. So we imagine this American Supreme Court as an institution that has been designed for this task of declaring laws unconstitutional. We imagine this building, but this building only is built in 1935. The court starts off, they have to do the circuit riding, yeah? From state to state on a horse, it's freezing, it's cold, it's miserably paid, it has no prestige. And if you're appointed to the US Supreme Court in those cases, it's like a punishment. Yeah? And people reject it. They don't want to be Supreme Court judges. Um, so the court is also off to a rough start. It passes a judgment that gets immediately overridden by a constitutional amendment, and so on and so forth. And then something happens when this man is Chief Justice of the US Supreme Court, Chief Justice John Marshall, um, again, a highly political figure, leader of the Federalist Party in West Virginia, Secretary of State under John Adams, and uh, so somebody who understands how politics works, how separation of powers and checks and balances works. So he is confronted with the following dilemma. They are the Federalists and they are the Republicans. Yeah? It's, there's a lot of partisanship from the moment of the founding of the Republic. Um, there's an enormous sense of uh, yeah, uh, enemy uh, between John Adams, the outgoing president, and the incoming president, Jefferson. So Adams loses the election against Jefferson, and what does he do as he's leaving office? He appoints all these midnight judges under the new Judiciary Act from 1801. Yeah? Do you all know this? Okay. Yeah, so I can be quicker. So Adams appoints these judges, 
They call the midnight judges. Jefferson is very upset about it and instructs Madison, don't hand out the Judicial Commission. And until I hand out this document to you, you are actually not appointed as a judge. Okay? So Marbury sues Madison and says to the US Supreme Court, force Madison to give me this commission. And now, here's the genius of uh, Clinton's article. He reconceptualizes this entire thing as a game. Okay? And he says, who moves first? Who moves next? What does Jefferson want? How much can Chief Justice Marshall get out of it? Okay? Now, there are certain things Chief Justice Marshall doesn't want to do. It's a very fragile state for the judiciary, so you don't want to make your president too angry. Okay? Um, probably it's a good idea to give in and give Jefferson and Madison what they want. Yeah? You're face-to-face -face with a powerful executive. And the genius of Marbury is, of this decision is, that the Chief Justice says, how do we get to this result? We invent the power of unconstitutionality and declare the Judiciary Act of 1801 unconstitutional. So the result that Jefferson gets is exactly what Jefferson wants. Yeah? And the principle that the court can strike down legislation has no immediate direct consequences. It may have for Jefferson's successor, yeah? but there's nothing he really has to fear at this particular point of time. And I think that's a very strong pattern in constitutional judicial review is this question of time. Yeah? A smart court will use judicial time in such a way that for the politicians in power, nothing much happens. German constitutional court does this all the time, strikes down a new pension act or a new piece of legislation and says, well, you have eight or ten years to fix it. Yeah? Who's going to be a politician in eight or ten years? By then, they're all out of power. Yeah? Very similar with the establishment of the primacy of EU law. That's established by courts, so you have all this maneuvering of the courts, how they strategically decide. And I think, um, although Keshwananda always is the key basic structure case, for me, the Rajnarayan election case is actually very important in the sense that I see a similar dynamic as in Marbury versus Madison. Right? So Indira Gandhi loses in the Alabar High Court. Krishna Aya stays the judgment, so now the potential that is, she's going to be robbed of her office as Prime Minister is very real. She declares emergency and the 39th Amendment sort of abolishes retrospective judicial review. What can the court do? Obviously, what does Indira Gandhi want? She doesn't care much about constitutional principles. She wants to stay in power. So that's what you have to give her. So you declare her election valid. And at the same time, you strike down, I think it's Section 4 of the 39th Amendment, and you reaffirm the basic structure. It's almost exactly the same as Marbury versus Madison, right? So it's, again, a brilliant maneuver of a court, giving the politician everything the politician wants, but at the same time establishing a principle that maybe 20, 30 years later really comes back and gives the court enormous power. And there is a model for this for these strategic maneuvers and the relationship between the court in a separation of powers game. And I'll also put this paper online. This paper is every academic's dream. Yeah, it's a permanent footnote and it was only a conference paper. It's not written by a lawyer, it's written by an economist. Yeah? Um, I think he was working for congressional research at that point of time and he looked at judicial influence on congressional policy making. And so the model he developed is he had this idea, if you think about policy in space, right, then you can say the Congress party in the 1950s stands here on Latin America. Okay? And this is sort of their tolerance interval. As long as the Supreme Court decides within this realm, they're going to be fine with it. Now, according to Marx's separation of powers model, it's a hard constitutional court, probably, especially at the beginning, would decide in this area. Yeah, but what the Supreme Court does, it decides here and here and here, and you have one constitutional amendment after the other, yeah, triggering a constitutional crisis, especially with Polak Mark. And 
I think with Golak Nath, what the Supreme Court also misread is the impact of the Swatantra Party. Yeah? They thought that since Congress has lost their mental power, that this realm would have gotten bigger. Yeah? And then you all know what happened in 1971. Indira Gandhi fights an aggressive election campaign. And it's really interesting to look at those election posters where there are really direct attacks on the judiciary and uh, wins with a landslide, regains amendment power, and it can again, this whole game changes again. So there's a very interesting story to be told here. And the key variable in the story where a court wins more if is there's more in uncertainty. And the court risks to lose more if you have a very strong and stable government, in particular a dominant single party majority of the Congress system that can pass an amendment very, very easily. Yeah? So there are different phases in Indian politics that I think explain different phases of constitutional judicial review. Um, the model has been uh, phrased, uh, has been uh, conceptualized as an insurance model of judicial review by Tom Ginsburg. In this book, he compares Mongolia, South Korea, and Taiwan. Right? And he says, for instance, look at Taiwan with its authoritarian government. And you have a very, very passive judicial Juan, which is their constitutional court, um, which doesn't pass any judgments against the government. You enter into a period of democratic transition, and now you have a lot more uncertainty, uncertainty for the governing Kuomintang party. Right? Now you have the Democrat, Democrats as well. So every politician now knows I might be out of power. Right? It's not just the loss of amendment power. And once you realize as a politician that you're going to be out of power, suddenly constitutional judicial review is super attractive. Can you think of reasons why? I mean, assume you're an Indian politician. Okay, you made it into the Lok Sabha. Okay, you've got five years. How do you rank your chances of being re-elected? Do you rank them high? Low? Hmm? Low, right? It's a hyper-competitive political system with huge movements, okay? So it's not like the US where you can say, oh, my congressional district is formed in such a way, yeah, the boundary is drawn. Here, it's a really, really hyper-competitive political system. So now you know you're gonna be out of power. In which sense can a powerful constitutional court protect you? Which scenarios can you think of? Yeah, judicial review. So for instance, the next party comes in and says, oh, this politician has been corrupt. We're going to throw him in jail. So you have constitutional, you have judicial review to protect yourself against that. Okay? Hmm? Yeah? Yeah, which other scenarios can you imagine? Okay, yeah. What about fighting the new government in the court. Does that happen? Yeah, okay. So when you're in power, your realm for moving and deciding on policy is limited by this powerful constitutional court. But it also means whenever you're out of power and there's a good chance that you're going to be, yeah, then you can hunt the government which is in power, which means they cannot do what they want. So it's a trade-off, yeah? Does it make sense? Okay, it also means that you can entrench your policies more easily. Yeah? Um, that if an act that you pass, um, of course it can be repealed by the next government, but uh, if they don't have, uh, you know, there's a limit on time what the government can do. If they can't, this act sort of stays, right? And you can also pass legislation in which you defer implementation through the judiciary. So there are a lot of reasons why as a politician, you actually want to have constitutional judicial review. And I'd like you to spend a few minutes just talking in small bus groups, right? Just for two, three minutes, and the room should get really loud so that you wake up again because I've been speaking for 40 minutes, yeah? Just look at this and look what's happening to the Congress party since the provisional parliament. Provisional parliament, they have more than 80% of the seats. 
1951, more than 70% of the seats. Yeah, these are the seats. So they can pass any constitutional amendment they want because they're also holding the majority of the governments in the states. Yeah? Now, of course, there's internal factions within the Congress party, but nevertheless, it's a very powerful political party. Then here in 1967, that's when Golagnat happens. That's when Congress doesn't have, Indira Gandhi doesn't have amendment power. Right? So that's when the Supreme Court moves, but then loses big time. Because they're coming back here with amendment power, then post-emergency, it's gone, and then there's a new phase of Indian politics. Unstable minority governments, coalition governments with 10, 12 parties in the executive, and uh, no political party comes anywhere close to passing a controversial constitutional amendment easily. Okay? So I want you to consider the relationship between changes in India's party system. You might know a lot about the rise of regional parties, you all know about the downfall of the Congress system. And uh, so just think about it, what this does to constitutional judicial review. Yeah? Talk about it for two, three minutes, and then we'll have a discussion amongst all of us. Okay? Is it clear? Questions? Okay, then now it should get really loud and you start talking to each other.